everyone. Um, thank you for inviting. Is it enough? Can't you? Yes. Oh, sorry, technology, double, technically double challenged. Now I've got three things, sorry. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here. I'm so impressed at how many people are here and at, at, at the level of discussion that I've just heard. Um, and thank you again for inviting me. I think this is the second time that I'm here. Um, I think this is just a really fantastic symposium. So my... I was asked to talk today on diagnosing uh, TB in infants and children. I'm going to confine it to pulmonary TB because this is the major form of TB that I'm sure you are encountering in practice. And also because many of the principles that apply to pulmonary TB apply to extra pulmonary TB in children as well. And so as many of us know, the burden of childhood TB is very under-recognized. And this is because traditionally reporting of TB cases has rested on smear positivity. So finding a smear positive uh, case would uh, translate into this being TB and that is what would be reported to the World Health Organization as TB. But as we know, children firstly very seldom produce specimens and secondly even when they do, they usually smear negative. So this has been a very poor way of measuring the burden in children. And with this recognition um, has come uh, uh, a different reporting system for WHO, which now reports two um, age groups of TB, under five years and five to 14. But it does beg the question of what the best way to diagnose TB is in children. And this morning I'm going to take you through some of what's available and some of what's emerging. Even given the limitations of what we've had in the past for diagnosing TB, the estimates are that pediatric TB, and if you just focus on South Africa, accounts for about 16% of the overall caseload in the country. And that's very high, one in, four uh, one in five children, and is probably an underestimate given the limitations in terms of diagnosis. And we also know the problem of TB and HIV and that the epidemic of TB mirrors the epidemic of HIV, so the areas with highest TB prevalence are also the areas with highest HIV prevalence. And I'm sure all of you are aware of the impact in, of co-infection in HIV-infected children, so that HIV-infected children who develop TB have more rapid decline in their HIV status, much more um, uh, active um, HIV replication. They tend to get more severe disease with disseminated disease, miliary disease, TB meningitis. There's a higher mortality in HIV-infected compared to uninfected children. And HIV-infected children have an increased risk of disease at all ages, whereas you know in children who are immunocompetent, the highest risk of disease is in the first year of life, and especially of disseminated disease. That is not true for HIV-infected children, who have, may have a similar risk throughout their life. Of course, antiretroviral therapy has changed a lot of this. Um, with uh, substantial reductions in the risk of disease and also of mortality from TB. But nevertheless, HIV-infected children, even those on, established on antiretrovirals, remain at higher risk of TB and at more risk of, uh, of, of severe disease compared to HIV-uninfected children. There's the problem of pill burden. Uh, I don't need to tell an audience like this about the problems of taking both antiretrovirals and um, anti-TB drugs, the side effects, um, the issues of immune reconstitution syndrome, uh, problems with adherence in, in taking such a large number of medicines. And of course, even in children who aren't HIV infected themselves, but who live in households where members of the household are H, there's, an, uh, there's a parent or a adult who's HIV infected, they are, have a much higher exposure to TB than non-HIV households. Now this, um, I think, is a very startling number and it shows the risk of HIV infected children who are mostly not on heart, the risk for TB. And so if you look at, uh, this was a study of INH versus placebo for prevention of primary TB in HIV infected children. And to our horror, if you look at HIV-infected children who were not on INH, almost one in four were at risk for developing TB disease. We're not talking about infection here. This is not just a, 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 a positive PPD. This is actual pulmonary TB or disseminated TB. One in four uh, per year, um, uh, almost 23% uh, of children would have developed TB disease 
um, per year in the, in the children who were not on uh, antiretrovirals. Um, as I said, antiretrovirals have substantially lowered this risk, but it is still much higher than um, HIV uninfected children. Um, just to the other part of this graph shows that if you take INH prophylaxis as primary prophylaxis, so this is not INH prophylaxis given to children who are, who are exposed to an adult TB contact, this is INH prophylaxis given to all HIV infected children as a primary strategy, the risk of developing TB in fact is reduced by about 70%. Okay, this is what I was talking about in terms of the age-related risk of TB disease, so that for most children, uh, the risk either of pulmonary TB in the blue bars or um, uh, disseminated TB in the red bars diminishes substantially during childhood and a resurgence of pulmonary TB in adolescence. But in fact, for HIV-infected children, the risk probably looks like that. So let's turn to diagnosis, given that uh, TB is a very big problem, particularly in HIV-infected children and in adults, and look at what we've got and what we can do better. So basically, to diagnose TB, there are two broad ways. Either you detect the organism, or you detect the um, child's response to the organism. And in terms of detection of organism, uh, we've got smear, which I've already said is very performs very poorly in children. We've got culture, and we have had improved culture methods. Liquid culture is much better than solid uh, culture, and liquid culture is standard in South Africa here. Um, we, we may be able to detect the antigen, and I'll sp speak a little bit more about that um, towards the end, and more recently molecular methods, PCR methods, to detect small amounts of the organism. Um, and then the second way is to detect an immune response, and that's what we do when we me measure the tuberculin skin test. We, that's the, uh, an immune response to TB infection. Or more recently, interferon assays, which are a similar principle to the tuberculin skin test, measuring uh, 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 the body's immune response to TB infection. And lastly, serology. And I'll just say a few words about each of these as we go along. So what we currently use are clinical criteria. We use radiology. We still rely heavily on the chest X-ray. Uh, and we do use immune response in terms of skin testing, um, the newer tests being uh, the interferon gamma release assays and serology. We also occasionally use microbiologic confirmation. We use it a lot in adults for smear and culture with improved culture methods. We haven't tended to use these um, much in children. And more recently, a big shift to molecular diagnosis, um, and uh, there is some work on antigen detection. So let me go through these first. So let's ask a question to start off with. How good is clinical diagnosis in children? And you're all familiar with clinical diagnosis, which is basically signs and symptoms with a tuberculin skin test and with a chest X-ray. And those of you who work in the field, I'm sure, will agree with me that these perform particularly poorly, especially in HIV-infected children, malnourished children, young children, or children with very severe disease. These are, and these represent the major um, children who are at risk for severe disease because they're not, the signs and symptoms and radiology is nonspecific. So the same signs and symptoms from TB you can get from other causes of pneumonia, other causes of HIV-associated respiratory disease. And just let me show you how poorly they perform um, if you look at one of the studies. So this was a study looking at the proportion of children diagnosed with TB using nine different scoring systems. This is a study that is located in Worcester. It's a low HIV prevalence area. In fact, I think about maybe 1% of, of children in the study, in fact, have HIV. And what the investigators looked at is how these nine scoring systems. And you can see, for example, in this scoring system, 7% of children were diagnosed with TB. In this scoring system, almost 90% of children were diagnosed with TB. Huge variability in the rate at which you diagnose TB dependent on the scoring systems. Um, the, these scoring systems are compared against children who have definite or probable TB um, in the study. Now, the other problem with, with, with um, clinical um, symptoms is that we've tended to use chronic symptoms. The dogma is that children with TB have chronic cough, they cough for two weeks, probably four weeks, they have failure to thrive, they have weight loss. But is this actually true? And I think. Uh, this is not entirely true. 
increasingly we've seen children with acute pneumonia who are investigated for TB to have a very high incidence of TB. So for example, if you look at children hospitalized with pneumonia, 8% have culture-confirmed disease. This is not a clinical diagnosis, culture-confirmed disease. Now we know that culture is not that great for diagnosing TB in children. So you could times that by three. You could say approximately 24% of children with acute pneumonia have culture-confirmed TB in, in, in our setting in Cape Town, also in Malawi, also here in Gauteng. Very, very similar rates. In KwaZulu-Natal, it's even worse. 15% of children admitted with severe pneumonia had culture-confirmed TB. And then in, an, uh, in uh, another interesting study also done at Baragwanath Hospital, um, David Moore showed that if you looked at children at, uh, who had culture-confirmed TB and you asked how long had their symptoms been, almost 80% had symptoms less than four days, cough less than four days. Is TB, pulmonary TB a chronic disease in children? It looks like it's very much an acute disease looking at these, uh, at those figures. Um, now, WHO and the NIH and all these um, organizations have recognized the problem with clinical diagnosis. And so they convened a meeting last year in, in, uh, at the NIH to develop standardized case definitions for evaluation of, so that you could have a standardized diagnosis for children. Um, and uh, they came up with consensus clinical case definitions. Important to realize this is they did not do a systematic review. These are consensus expert opinion and standard methodological approaches for new diagnostics in children. And this is the clinical case definitions they came up with. You could have confirmed TB if you have culture confirmation and a sign or symptom, probable TB if you have a sign or symptom and a chest X-ray that's consistent, and exposure or response to therapy or positive PPD. Positive uh, possible TB if you have just one um, a sign and symptom and a chest x-ray and then they've got a fourth category of TB unlikely and not TB if it's an alternative diagnosis. But let's look at the clinical signs and symptoms that they're suggesting to use. Again, chronic cough, weight loss and failure to thrive, persistent fever, persistent lethargy. History of exposure I think we'd all agree with, a household contact, but within 24 months, very long period, and a response to treatment as measured by a two-month follow-up period. Now, I've already showed you that these chronic symptoms probably do not bear up. I'm going to show you one more si study. Um, also, this, a study done in Worcester in a, high, uh, in a low HIV prevalence area. Almost 1,500 children under two years of age who were followed, and um, uh, about 12% developed culture-positive TB. And what were the signs associated with culture positivity? Wheeze, lower chest retractions, a positive skin test, and a chest X-ray suggested. Wheeze and lower chest retractions don't appear anywhere in any algorithms. And this suggests that lymph node involvement and airway compression may be a very important sign in our setting. Not associated with a culture-confirmed TB, fever, chronic cough, weight loss, failure to thrive. Those children had other reasons for those symptoms. So I think we've got to be very, very wary of clinical diagnosis and more so in HIV-infected children. I've, I've, I've stressed that this is a low HIV uh, prevalence population because when you start talking about HIV-infected children, clinical diagnosis is even more complicated. We know that failure to, to thrive, chronic weight loss, um, fatigue, etc., are, are, are features of HIV and of many HIV-associated illnesses, not only TB. So can we do better th uh, with radiological diagnosis? And um, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with the uh, GON focus, these kind of radiological pictures, a complicated GON focus where you get breakdown of, of that area, lymph node compression, and this is the, or lymph node involvement at least, sorry, the donut sign around the hyla um, area of children with, with um, uh, lymph, uh, 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 lymph node involvement. Um, complicated lymph node disease, I'm sorry, it's not projecting very well here. This actually should show um, a compression of the left main stem bronchus and hyperinflation, a bore valve effect on that left side, and then caseating expansile pneumonia again, you can see with uh, almost compression of that left main stem bronchus and shift to the right side. And large, uh, lastly, adult type cavitary disease, which we tend to see more in adolescent populations, but also uh, HIV-infected children have an increased risk of developing caseating disease. 
So these look like beautiful x-rays, but how good, how specific are they? If you see those x-rays, how specific are they for TB? And in fact, if you look at the literature, the one sign that is most widely used for um, diagnosis of pulmonary TB in children is hyaladenopathy. And if you look at the studies, there is huge inter and intra observer variation. So what one person interprets as hyaladenopathy, another doesn't. And even the same person interpreting the same x-ray days apart interprets them differently. In fact, if you give uh, two people two different x-rays with hyaladenopathy, there's agreement only in 30% of the cases. And you think that a lateral x-ray might improve it, but the studies show that the accuracy is not even improved with a lateral x-ray. And of course, in HIV-infected children, we have the added problem of the high incidence of, or high prevalence of HIV-associated chronic disease, which we know that about 30% of HIV-infected children will have by, the, by about four years of age. And so just to show you one study, in case you don't believe me, if you look, uh, these are assessments of chest x-rays by three expert uh, pediatric assessors, very experienced people. Uh, and they had to say whether, on, based on the x-ray, it was likely TB, um, highly likely, likely, or may have TB. And look at the variability here. 11% said, uh, you know, that uh, any of these were, were likely. 14% um, of reviewer two, almost 51% in reviewer three. Uh, and when they were asked to say whether x-rays did, did not indicate TB, so they were inconclusive, abnormal, but not TB or normal, again, 82% of x-rays were considered to be negative by this reviewer, 66% by this reviewer, and 31% by this reviewer. Wide variability. I'm not sure that x-ray gives us the answer. So the expert consensus from uh, the NIH uh, recommends that one should have at least two expert um, readers, a third reader where there's discordant results, that you need to do AP and lateral x-rays, independent and blind review. In other words, um, you should know the clinical characteristics or the, uh, if there are any microbiological characteristics, digital images, and they actually suggest this kind of form which is, is actually a very nice form, but as you can see, is quite labor intensive to report on. And the kind of um, uh, reporting they're suggesting in terms of two reviewers and a third, if there's, if, if, if there's uh, not agreement, I think is not realistic in our setting, or in most settings where there's a high prevalence of, of childhood TB. Okay, so can we do de better with tests for, um, for host immune detection? And all of you know the problems with tuberculin skin testing. It's dependent on technique. The interpretation is quite variable. You have to very precisely measure the transverse diameter of induration. <laughs> it requires standard application and interpretation. And there's debate in some areas about what constitutes a positive response, depending on the epidemiology, for example, of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. If you have HIV infected, a five millimeter cutoff is taken as positive. What's positive if you had previous BCG, then you must have a cutoff greater than 15 millimeters in non-HIV infected children. So there are all these issues around um, tuberculin skin testing. And the biggest issue, I think, for us is we know that tuberculin skin testing performs very poorly in HIV infected children and in malnourished children. Again, two of the major patient populations. What about gamma interferon assays? I'm sure you've heard quite a, a lot about them. There are two commercially available assays. Um, sorry, I've left out one, sign, uh, one slide, but it doesn't matter. Um, and there are two meta-analyses. The one shows that in high burden countries like us, gamma interferon assays will detect about 55% of children with TB and perform somewhat better, 70% in low burden areas. Now it's important to point out that this is detection of, of TB disease. If you get a positive gamma interferon assay, it's like a tuberculin skin test. It doesn't tell you if the child's infected or if they're diseased. All you know is that they have some infection, that they have had a TB infection or that they may currently have a TB infection. Um, and generally, um, the, the, the um, gamma interferon assays and tuberculin skin tests perform similarly. So you don't get anything additional from doing a gamma interferon assay in a child. Again, there's a, a problem in that um, some children will have positive gamma interferon assays and negative uh, skin tests and vice versa. And actually, if you do both of them, you'll get a higher pickup for um, TB infection in children 
but that adds cost and um, uh, and and uh, additional uh, a burden to the child. So just to look at, if you look at tuberculin skin test and you say how good is that for detecting, detecting active TB in children, these are non-HIV infected children, uh, in fact tuberculin skin test performs quite well in non-immunosuppressed children, detects almost uh, just in excess of 80% of children with active TB, um, both in, um, uh, in high income countries and in um, low or middle income countries. What about quantiferon, which is the one commercially available assay? Very similar, 86% overall detection of 83%. But just, I just want to point out that, in fact, the detection by quantiferon in low or middle income countries is much lower compared to high income countries, only around a 60% detection. And similarly, for the uh, T-spot, which is the other commercially available assay, 86% detection of children with TB in high income countries, somewhat better uh, in low income countries at 77%. And so overall detection of around 80%, whether you use a quantiferon or a, uh, a T-spot or a tuberculin skin test. So the critical question is, do these um, interferon gamma assays add anything above um, a tuberculin skin test? Um, and given the cost and the need for a blood test, and this, you need to send it away to a laboratory, and the child must return uh, for uh, follow-up, or, or for the results at least. In general, I think it's fair to say that gamma interferon assays do not add anything more to the diagnosis of, palm, uh, of pulmonary TB or of active TB um, compared to tuberculin skin testing in children with normal immunity. There's not a lot of data, but there are some um, studies that do show, however, that they are more sensitive in young children, in HIV-infected children, and in malnourished children, and that's particularly because the tuberculin skin test performs so poorly in those children. So there may certainly be a role for gamma interferon assays here in terms of detecting TB infection. The World Health Organization, however, has recommended against their use in low- or middle-income countries based on their cost and, and the, the sort of infrastructure that is needed to implement them. Quick word about serological diagnosis. And uh, we don't really have a lot of serological diagnosis in, happening in our country. There are some commercially available um, assays available, but it's, serological tests are widely used throughout the world. Um, 17 of 22 high burden TB countries, a lot in India and Southeast Asia, use them. You can see South Africa is actually on this list. Um, and last year, the, the WHO published the first ever negative policy on serological tests, rec strongly recommending against their use um, because they perform very poorly. They um, have very imprecise sensitivity and specificity, and their harms and risks far outweigh any potential benefits. So the answer is serological assays are currently not to be used. There is ongoing work in the development of serological assays, and maybe in time we will have a better serological assay, um, but for the moment the commercially available ones are useless. So now to turn to microbiological diagnosis, and I'm going to spend the bulk of the rest of the talk on this. And I hope I've convinced you that we actually do not have good tools for diagnosing TB in children till now. And this adds to the need to actually make a microbiological diagnosis in children. Now, why do we even have to state this because, as you all know, microbiological diagnosis is not standard in children, and there are a whole lot of prevailing perceptions like you can't do it in children, it's not possible, it's not practical, it's very difficult to do, it's not useful. Micro you, you can't get sputum or whatever, and, and even if you do, it's not going to give you much, m many results. Not possible in very young children or infants, and certainly in primary care settings, we shouldn't even attempt to do it. And I want to show you that these are myths. And in the next few uh, slides, I'm going to show you the data to not only show that we should be doing microbiological diagnosis, but to suggest that what the results on children are as good, if not better, than those we are getting on adults, where microbiological diagnosis is standard in primary care settings. Okay. So why make a microbiological diagnosis in children? Well, it's fantastic to have a confirmed diagnosis where you can target your therapy and also know the resistance pattern of the organism. And in the era of emerging drug resistance, I think this is becoming increasingly an issue. In addition, with the advent of molecular methods, we've got rapid diagnostic tests now. We can diagnose TB within the day. 
And so again, this ensures timely treatment. Now, is this important in children? Well, if you look at the literature, up to 40 to 50% of children who are hospitalized with suspected TB, who then turn out to have culture-confirmed TB, are discharged from hospital without treatment. Why is that? Because culture takes four to six weeks. So they're discharged without having been thought to have TB or considered to be at low, uh, low risk for TB and discharged. And in the time in which they're discharged, there's obviously a lot of potential for um, worsening of the illness. There may be loss to follow up. There may be um, transmission of the disease and so on. This is a, a, from a Baragwanath study, but there are other studies um, at, in KwaZulu-Natal and in Cape Town again. This is a startling figure. There's also the potential for rapid deterioration and spread, especially in very young children. Um, development of miliary TB and so on can happen quite quickly. And of course, I've spoken to the problems of HIV and TB, so that if we can minimize the pill burden, if a child does not need to take uh, TB therapy, then it would be great not to have to put them onto TB therapy, as opposed to having a confirmed diagnosis where one can justify that large, big, that large pill burden. So if we want to make a diagnosis, a microbiological diagnosis, what's the best way, uh, way of making it? And I want to say critically here, the quality and the type of specimen are crucial. I've heard you know, much of the story about um, not being able to make a microbiological diagnosis in children or not getting anything from sputum is related to the quality and the type of specimen. And, and this is essential. So if you are going to go out and start trying to make a more confirmed diagnosis of TB in children. It's really essential that you get the best specimen possible. And that we know this is true even, for example, in TB meningitis, where the amount of volume of CSF that you take is critical. If you take one mil, you've got a very low probability of uh, detecting MTB in that specimen. If you take five mils, your, your, your chances of detecting MTB are increased like tenfold. Okay, so which specimen should we use? As you know, gastric lavages were the standard diagnosis. Three gastric lavages, early morning specimens, usually requiring hospitalization and overnight starve. Any of you who've done gastric lavage know it's a horrible thing to do to the child and the children really don't like it. And the yield has been relatively low. Um, we've done, uh, we've spent the last I don't know how long it is, probably about eight years, uh, looking at induced sputum and more recently nasopharyngeal specimens for better diagnosis of TB in children. And I want to take you through some of these results. So just for those of you who may not be familiar with um, induced sputum in children, how you do this is you give a hypertonic nebulization. Um, uh, so you use hypertonic saline, which is, it can be three or 5% saline in a nebulization, much the same as you would uh, I don't know if you are routinely treating, for example, bronchiolitis. That's the standard treatment for bronchiolitis these days, hypertonic saline with a bronchodilator in. It's exactly the same as what we do here. So we give this with a, bron a short-acting bronchodilator salbutamol added. Uh, nebulize them together. And what this does is it draws the interstitial fluid into the airways, mobilizes the lower respiratory tract secretions, it stimulates a cough, so you want to hear the children coughing, and what happens is that the lower respiratory tract secretions are then moved up, and you can either ask the child to cough out if the child's old enough, or you can suction the child to get those secretions. Um, so I've already been through the method. We uh, we give a uh, nebulization with a bronchodilator. You can actually give a bronchodilator first with a meter dose inhaler and spacer, but if you want to save time, you can just add it to the hypertonic saline nebulization. And then we recommend suctioning through the nose rather than the oropharynx. Um, and older children can, of course, uh, cough out, and rapid transport to the lab is important for viability. And here's one of the little children at Red Cross having me. Um, nebulization. There's no limit um, in terms of the lower age in which it can be done. It can be done in neonates and it can be done all the way up. In fact, this is a technique that is now used in adults where adults are un in adults who can't um, produce a sputum specimen by themselves. Okay, so this was the first um, study, uh, the first major study. And in this study, we looked at 250 children who were admitted to Red Cross who we thought clinically may have TB based on their clinical presentation. You'll see they were quite young, just over a year of age. And we said we weren't sure whether induced sputum would perform well at all, so we compared three induced sputa to three gastric lavages. 
uh, on three separate days. And in fact, um, the, the yield from induced sputum, and this is for culture, we did smear and culture on these, on these specimens, was threefold higher than on gastric lavage. We found 54 cases of culture confirmed TB in, on induced sputum and only 40 on gastric lavage. And a single sputum gave almost the identical number of cases as did three gastric lavages. So from that, we took that if you did a single induced sputum in children, you no longer had to keep them in hospital for three days. In fact, you didn't have to hospitalize them at all because induced sputum can be done as an outpatient and that a single sputum was as good as three gastric lavages. I'm often asked, how young could you do this in? Again, I want to point out there's no lower limit. The youngest child undergoing induced sputum in this study was a month. Almost 50% were younger than three years. The youngest culture positive child was three months. There's no difference in culture rates by HIV. It's as effective in HIV infected and uninfected children. And I'm also often asked, well, did you need to do three sputums? So if you do one sputum, right, you get the same yield as three gastric lavages. But if you do three sputums, you get an even higher yield. And uh, what we found is that the second sputum yielded an, gave an extra 15% of children so the, who weren't positive on the first sputum. And the third specimen increased the yield by 7%. So the more sputums you do, the higher you yield. And this is a balance between cost and convenience and, and whether the... So currently what we're recommending is two induced sputums. I'll come back to that. Uh, again, I want to highlight that sputum uh, collection is routine in adult TB programs and primary care. And the criticism of this study is, of course, it's based in a tertiary centre, Red Cross. So can you move this out to primary care? And so this is another study that we then undertook in a primary care setting, Kuyasa, a clinic in Kailicha. 270 children, median age of around three years. And this time we just did two sputums on two separate days just for smear and culture, and we asked, was this effective, and how did it influence management? Did it change management at all? So first point to, to say is that indu induced sputum was successful in almost all children. And the people doing this induced sputum were the nurses in the clinic. We trained them, and I'll show you some of that also. And about 11% of children were positive by culture for TB. That's very similar to adults. In fact, it's higher than the... Than the um, yield from adults at primary care TB clinics and again uh, about a quarter HIV infected. Did it change management? 22% of children were not clinically diagnosed, not put on to TB treatment and only got put on to TB treatment when these results became available. That's a big increase in diagnostic yield. Uh, induced sputum was well tolerated, there were no severe adverse events and we asked the nurses doing it how easy it was to do and you will see this, this graph is for very easy, easy, um, uh, uh, neither easy nor difficult, difficult and very difficult. 90% of nurses graded the, um, uh, the procedure as very easy or easy to do. So here I'm showing you data that I think um, is, is strong to show that induced sputum can be done in primary care settings, that existing staff can be trained to do it, that it provides a good yield for children with, t uh, with suspected TB and that it changes management. Just using culture. This is without adding expert into the mix. Okay. So now I'll come to, to expert because this is even going to push us more to, to make a microdiagnosis in children. And so you know, very, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with expert. Is ev everyone familiar with this test or, or do I need to? I see a lot of head nods. So it's, it's a rapid point of care. It's designed for rapid point of care. Diagnosis of TB detects the gene of M. tuberculosis and also detects the gene for rifampicin resistance. And it's all in tube. So the specimen is put in a bottle. Uh, liquefaction is uh, added. And then everything after there is automated. And the test takes about two hours to get a result in. OK. Um, uh, of course, the, the, the um, great advantage is not only how rapidly you get a result, but you also get a result that tells you if this is a rifampicin-resistant isolate or not. So in adults, as I'm sure you know, it's performed quite wo very well. 92% uh, it detects 92% of adults with culture-confirmed TB, not um, as high in smear-negative disease, 
um, but it goes up if you do a second test and it's very specific. So if you get a positive expert, it means that's M tuberculosis, nothing else. So based on these results, the World Health Organization recommended in 2011 that expert replace smear for pulmonary TB as the initial diagnostic test in areas of high HIV or drug resistance. And this included a recommend, this was the same recommendation was for children, um, even though there hasn't been a lot of, um, of, of, of research in this. Um, and, but I think that was largely based on our um, study and this is now a study looking at expert for diagnosis of pulmonary TB in children. And let me take you through this, this study. So this was not dissimilar to the other study that I showed you. We took children who were hospitalized at Red Cross with suspected TB. And this time we just did two induced sputums. And we didn't only do smear and culture, but we added expert. Okay, so two... Around 500 children enrolled, again most um, had uh, uh, induced sputum, almost all had one and, and some had two. You'll see there's a little bit of a drop off because some children are discharged and we can't do a second specimen. Um, median age, uh, just under, uh, just about a year and a half and there were 70 children who had culture confirmed disease, 16% of culture confirmation, of whom expert detected 74%. So seven, quite similar to the adult data. So, how did smear work? Smear detected only uh, about a third of the children and expert worked very well. All the smear positive cases were detected by expert, less well as I showed you for adults uh, in smear negative disease, but overall a detection rate of 76% of cases. A very reasonable detection rate. Again, do we need one or two specimens? In fact, uh, there was a big increment in the second expert on the second induced sputum. So in, if, if, if uh, you've got 28% more children with a second expert test. Remember I showed you that the second culture detected about 15% extra children in the previous study. Very similar figure in this study where we have 14% of extra children detected on culture. Uh, very good specificity and it accurately detected rifampicin resistance and of course the results were very fast. Now, um, so here are uh, a more detailed analysis of the results. If you only did um, one expert, then the sensitive, you d only detected about 60% of children with culture confirmed TB. If you did two, it went up to around 72%. And similar results for HIV infected and uninfected children. Uh, in fact, and this is a very interesting thing that has come consistently showing in our results, that expert performs better in HIV infected children and in uninfected children, unlike in, in adults. And what we've noticed is that more of our HIV infected children have smear positive disease. Um, so it may be that HIV infected children, when they get TB, tend to get more extensive uh, uncontrolled disease. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing in the expert results. But these, there's no statistical difference between the yield in HIV infected and uninfected children. And smear only detected a third of children, 33%. So expert was much better than smear, detected more than twice the number, and of course detected it much quickly with rifampicin resistance. I've already told you about the increment, I don't need to go. Okay. So I think if we could roll out induced sputum for children, and we could do two sputums and two um, experts on them with culture, that would be a great advance. But I there are many uh, areas where upscaling for induced sputum is difficult uh, and where um, the resources do not yet exist and the mind shift to do induced sputum in children has not yet happened. Um, and we wondered whether nasopharyngeal aspirates may offer a reasonable specimen. So um, uh, those of you in the field know that the attraction of nasopharyngeal aspirates are they're relatively easy to do, they're non-invasive, relatively non-invasive, and there's also minimal risk of nosoconial infection. And there has been some suggestion from the literature that nasopharyngeal aspirates may provide some yield for, um, for, for TB in children. So this is a study from Peru um, which compared two nasopharyngeal aspirates with two gastric lavages. The numbers are small, I think there were only uh, a only 10% culture positive rate in, 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 in this study. It, it turned out to be, I can't exactly remember the numbers, but I, if I recall correctly, it's around uh, 30 or 40 cases of children with TB. Disappointingly, 
Um, and all the, all the cases were detected on gastric lavage. Disappointingly, uh, nasopharyngeal aspirates only detected 50% of the cases. And when PCR, and this was an in-house PCR, not expert or, or, in, or a commercially available PCR was done, it performed very poorly. It only detected around 40% of cases. This study didn't compare induced sputum, it didn't use expert. There's another small Ugandan, and, and I should say the children in the study are older, around four years of age. There's a, another Ugandan study, um, also children around four years of age that compared, again, your small number of children, compared culture and um, uh, PCR on induced sputum to nasopharyngeal aspirates. There were only 24 culture positive cases. And in fact, they found culture similar on induced sputum and nasopharyngeal aspirates, um, but PCR um, performed um, quite poorly, about 60% sensitivity, and also there were a number of false positives. But some suggestion that nasopharyngeal aspirates may be useful. So, so we set out to investigate this, and similar to the last study, what we did is we didn't only do two sputums, but we also did two nasopharyngeal aspirates, and we paired them. So we did the first child um, came in, they would have the nasopharyngeal aspirate first, and that's important, then their sputum. Then we would wait four hours or preferably the next day, do the second nasopharyngeal aspirate followed by the second induced sputum, so in pairs. Um, five, just over 500 children enrolled in the study um, uh, um, who had one sputum and one as, uh, nasopharyngeal aspirate, around 400 at two pairs. Again, median age of a year and a half and about a, a quarter HIV infected. Similar rate of uh, culture confirmed TB, 87 cases of uh, definite TB. And now look at the rates of detection. Culture, 16%. Smear, 6%. Expert, 15%. Uh, the first point I want to make is that sputum was better for culture than, in, than nasopharyngeal aspirates. So you detected 84 of the 87 cases, 97% of all the culture confirmed cases by sputum and only 61 of the cases on nasopharyngeal aspirate. So if you're going to do culture, rather do induced sputum. Uh, and that makes sense because we know the organism sits in the lower respiratory tract and um, one would expect a higher yield from specimens coming from that. It also makes us reassured that in fact we are getting induced sputum when we do it. Expert, um, however, was positive um, detected 70 of these 87 cases, 81%. So very, very good detection rate. Uh, again, very good for smear positive cases, detecting all of them, and slightly lower in smear negative cases. Oh, does that mean my time's up? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's fine. Um, now, um, did you need two specimens? Again, that's the question. Um, so we had, a, as I said, around 400 children who had two specimens. Again, 16% culture positive, so 63 cases who had culture positive. The same, uh, same pattern that induced sputum is better than nasopharyngeal aspirates for culture. But this is a very important result that if you look at two experts on sputum, you detect 71% of cases. If you look at two experts on nasopharyngeal aspirates, you detect 65% of cases. And there's no difference, a statistical difference. So that means you can do two experts on nasopharyngeal aspirates and you'll detect around 70% of children with TB. If you can't do induced sputum, two experts on nasopharyngeal aspirates is a very reasonable way to go. Um, and of course, the advantage is that it, uh, you know, it's much better detection than smear, the same day results, and um, the detection of rifampicin resistance. And the results are similar in HIV infected compared to uninfected children. If anything, expert looks like it's performing better, as I showed you before, for HIV infected children. Um, how much extra did you get on the second sputum? So if you look at culture, uh, doing a second sp sputum gave you 18% more cases, similar to the 14.5 or 15% I showed you before. Uh, no uh, addition with smear. And if you looked at expert, in fact, there was a 25% increase in cases 
an expert on sputum. So again, I think this highlights that if you are going to set up microbiological diagnosis for children, you must do two specimens. If you only do one, you're only going to detect around 50, 55% of cases. Um, what about, do you need two nasopharyngeal aspirates? Um, again, uh, if you looked at culture, yes, it gave you a big increment, but we've already said that culture is not a great test on nasopharyngeal aspirates. And if you look at expert, the increment was huge, a 37% increment. So again, just to stress, if all you can do in your setting is nasopharyngeal aspirates, that's okay, but you must do two. Uh, I just want to stress that you men uh, I mentioned when, when in the methodology that we would do pairs. So children would come in and have one nasopharyngeal aspirate, then one sputum. And some children were done on the same day, the second pair, four hours later, and some children were done on the next day. And if you compare the children who were done on the same day to those who were done on the next day, the, the yield is much higher if you do it on the next day. So that's another practice point. If you're going to set this up and you're going to do two specimens, it's preferable to do them on uh, sequential days. And that also makes sense because it gives time for secretions to accumulate again in the upper respiratory tract. Okay. Uh, uh, it was very specific, so if you detected, uh, if expert was positive, then it was M. tuberculosis. We didn't have any uh, uh, other organisms. Excellent detection for rifampicin resistance and same day results compared to 15 days, and 15 days is fast for culture. Isn't that amazing that you can get a same day result for a child with TB and know whether they're rifampicin resistant or not? Okay. So for me, the conclusions from all these studies in terms of the microbiological testing for children is that two experts on two induced sputum or two nasopharyngeal aspirates detect most cases of culture-confirmed TB in children. If you're going to use expert, you can use it either on nasopharyngeal aspirates or induced sputum. If you're going to use culture, use induced sputum. Expert is much better than smear. You need two specimens, and I've stressed the specificity and FOST rate to culture. Okay, I'm just going to end with a, another quick test um, and maybe I should just say of course expert doesn't solve all our problems. We have this big group of children who still have possible or probable TB who the cultures are negative in and we're unclear if those children do have TB or not and we need a better diagnostic test for those children. In fact in our cohort there's a proportion of those children who are testing positive for expert. So who don't have positive cultures but who have positive experts and most of those we believe are true positives because if you follow those children on treatment, on TB treatment, they improve and respond to therapy. Um, so, but most of, uh, there's still a large group of children who are expert negative and culture negative who get treated for TB on clinical and radiological criteria who we still don't know do they have TB or not and that's the big challenge now to the TB field to develop a better test. Um, so will this test be any help? And this um, test I'm sure you know about from adult HIV infected um, people, uh, lipoarabinoman. It's a TB specific antigen, which is a heat stable glycolipid uh, made by metabolically active microbiota and filtered by the kidney. And what's been developed is the two different tests in which you can detect it in the urine. The one is like a dipsticks and the other is a lab based ELISA test. Um, and the results for this, the no published pediatric data uh, in adults is very variable sensitivity, detecting from 30% to 50% of adults with culture confirmed TB. Uh, and in fact, in adults, it seems to ha be useful only in a niche uh, patient population, and those are HIV infected uh, patients, adult patients with very low CD4 counts, CD4 counts lower than 200. Now that's not to dismiss this, this test because in this population, this is the population at highest risk of, um, of um, progression from TB and of early mortality from TB if not treated. So it detects a very, very important population. Very interesting work that I'm not going to show because it's adult work also shows that in adults who are expert positive, those also indicate, uh, expert positive on sputum, those also indicate a, a, a population of adults who are at risk for higher um, progression and for um, death, particularly HIV infected adults. And if you combine this test, LAM, with uh, 
with um, expert, you can identify a particularly susceptible population. So if you get a positive lamb or a positive expert, those are both um, adult HIV infected patients who can be rapidly identified who are at the highest risk for, for progression of disease. Um, we don't know whether the same is true in children. We're busy with the LAM study at the moment. Um, but it may be that in particular HIV infected children who are particularly immunosuppressed, that LAM turns out to be a useful test. It's, the results are not looking that promising, but we, need, we haven't analyzed them formally yet. Obviously the attraction of this test is that it's, you can do a dipsticks test. So it's, it's a, a very attractive test in terms of having it as a point of care test, but I don't think it's going to give us the answer for pediatric TB. So if I can just conclude with a few key messages. Um, microbiological diagnosis can be effectively done and I think the time has come for us for it to be imperative for children. There's a national rollout of expert for adults. We need to be advocating for this to be extended to children as well. Two induced sputum is the most optimal specimens for diagnosis. Um, expert represents a very important advance and can be done either on sputum or nasopharyngeal aspirates and when induced sputum or culture is unavailable two experts on nasopharyngeal aspirates is a very worthwhile investigation. We'll give you around 70% of children who are, would be culture positive. We clearly need to upscale induced sputum and expert in children in our health facilities, but we do beyond this need a better uh, point of care test to detect those children who are not currently detecting with these tests. Um, I've said that a lot uh, already. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't glibly say that we must upscale and make uh, pediatric diagnosis a priority. I'm aware of the training issues, the operational issues, the laboratory issues, the cost issues. But I think until, until we start to say that we must do this and we can do it, it's not going to happen. Um, we've trained now many, many um, nurses in induced sputum, not only in South Africa, but actually in many centers in Africa and in centers in South America, such as Colombia, who have, ra who have rolled out a national TB microbiological diagnosis for children. I think we can do better in our own setting here, and we must. Uh, and I think we need to shift the thinking of healthcare professionals and policymakers to insist that a microbiological diagnosis is important and possible in children. Thank you.